Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey everybody, welcome to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the show where we talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about how to kill it in real estate. And every episode is is different, man. It's it's you know, as you know, if you listen to the show, I never ask the same questions. It's very dynamic. I just go with the flow. Um Today's episode, today's episode, I did it a while back, and uh, and I forgot just how good this thing was. You know, if this if this episode had a title, and by the way, this is episode number ninety eight. We're on our way to a hundred. I don't know what I'm gonna do at a hundred. I really don't. I would love to do something big, you know, fireworks. I we may we may. I don't know what it's gonna be. Um, so, but uh, if this episode had a title it would be coming back from the dead today's guest so so glad i had this guy as a guest uh, this guy talks about yeah, his start this guy started a new construction uh 20 years odd years ago had 100 percent referrals um and uh and just just sort of his whole story man i mean this guy went from starting a company right and 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 along the way here or, or starting a brokerage along the way he's going to talk about he, he uses these great words and it would during the episode you'll know what they mean but he talks about mugging and clubbing his clients and that's not what you think it is he talks about planting and pampering um so but he talks about how he made it man he had houses he had a ton of cash and he also talks about how he didn't jettison early enough uh, when the tough times came. So uh, uh, we t- again, in this episode, he explains his whole rise to the top very, very well, very colorful, uh, and then now how he's rebuilding it. And we talk a lot about, you know, um, uh, a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset and how to manage that. Um, and, and, and he also, and you know, you're going to love the story. And I love stories. And this guy, it gives us a good story. But he also gives us very, very actionable tips. You know, he talks about how he started a book club for all his past clients and clients' kids and how he passed on five dollars if they read him something or, or wrote drove him a picture uh he talked about why he would take uh you know hire or talk get a photographer to come into a house and the photographer would take free pictures of his clients the, the ladies loved him they would use them as holiday gifts but just a way to build like a community this guy was truly the mayor anyhow <sighs> And you know what his guest, his, today's guest name, and sometimes I don't say it in the beginning, so I want to say it in this intro, Denny Grimes. So you're going to love it. Okay, a little housekeeping. If you are new to the show, the hashtag for the show is Unpack That Idea. Tweet it out, man. We have a very, very strong tribe on Twitter. And, and uh, as we, you know, you know what they say about venture capitalists and business people, right? Nobody works in August. I don't know about you guys. I mean, you, I get these emails from you guys going, hey, man, I'm pumped up. I want to, you know, I want to do 100 deals this year. I have one guy's like, hey, my goal is 200 million. I mean, this is, this is a guy, um, I don't know if he's listening. I'm not going to say his name. This particular guy does $60 million right now and he has a goal of 200 million. I'm like, hey, man, let me help you get there. Uh, but, I know from the tribe on Twitter, you guys are tweeting less and less, and the content's just as good. You know what it is? You guys aren't listening, or you guys are like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to it, and uh, maybe I'll get on Twitter after I take a nap. I don't know. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> hey, look, and if you don't know, I'm saying this very, very sparingly because I'm doing this kind of in the background. Go to the website. Go to superagentslive.com. I want you to do a couple things. I would love it if you're not subscribed on iTunes and Stitcher. Just hit the button, subscribe. You can get this on your device, your phone, your, you know, a Stitcher for, um, if you have an Android device, and iTunes if you have an Apple device. Um, so, um, you know what I also want you to do? Um, if you are an aspiring uh, agent, and if you have a team, how to get another 100 transactions? You know what you do? You get on the radio. Not this radio show. Well, you should come on this radio show, but, but 
your terrestrial AM FM radio show. We have been building in the last, for the last four months, we've been building an agency to put people on, to go out and negotiate radio ad spots for you, write the copy, uh, you know, pick the right station, you know, identify the most profitable state, all that stuff. So um, there's a tab. Go to our site again, superagentslive.com. There's a tab that says Dominate with Radio. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Even if you don't want to, look, I, just because you tell me, I had, a, I had one, a couple guys come on and go, hey, Toby, put me on the radio. I'm like, dude, you are not ready, man. You, you have to have a team. And I, I, you know, I want you to be successful if I do put you on the radio. So uh, that's it. All right. Hey, let's get to the show. Let's get to Denny Grimes. This guy is so good, man. Uh, I'm going to tell you in the beginning and not the end. If you like this guy's episode, reach out to him and tell me enjoy it. Because you know what? I'm going to I want him back on. I want this guy. We do a live Google Hangout every third Thursday of the month. And this is a guy that I want to have with me. All right. So Denny Grimes, here we go. Hey, Denny, thanks for taking the time out today. Hey, my pleasure, Toby. So listen, Denny, I've given the, the, the audience a brief overview of your background, but you know, I know you have a very rich background. Take a minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. All right. Well, uh, I've been uh, just over 30 years in southwest Florida in the area of Fort Myers and um, got into general real estate, spent a couple of years in the trenches, went into new home uh, construction for about 15 years and decided to get back and get out of jail, get into, get into the general real estate market again where you can have 100% control of your destiny. And I've been doing that. I started uh, using a lot of the techniques I've learned from general real estate agents and applied them to my business as a new home agent and developed and became the top salesman of the leading developer in our area with 100% referral business. And so I kind of built my business on a high touch uh, referral type uh, basis and in fact, in the new home environment, they didn't even allow me to take walk-in traffic. Everything I had to do would be self-generated. Uh, I, then I got in, into general real estate on uh, kind of a, a life-changing event. I went in one day to my developer on uh, Friday the 13th for a meeting. And uh, just note to self, next time you're invited to a meeting and nobody else is there but the HR guy <laughs> uh, on Friday the 13th, is not a good thing. Don't go. Don't go. Or just just, just bring the boxes with you. And you so... Go. And so it was a life-changing thing, and uh, it was one of those gut-check times for me. And I remember going to the gym the next day after basically they said they didn't need me anymore. I hadn't done anything wrong. They just basically had controlled too much of the, the, uh, the, of the sales. And so I went to the gym the next day, hung up my clothes next to a guy by the name of Jim. I knew his name was Jim because on his shirt – there was a letter J I M. He's, he's like a mechanic. And I'm thinking, Lord, I hope I don't have to resort to that because I can't use tools. <laughs> I got into general real estate, started building a team, and uh, at the peak of the market in 2005, I had a team of 26. We sold uh, 450 homes, $150 million worth of business, and wow. um, that, was, that was that. And then, of course, the last eight years, I've been riding the falls down and building my team back up for the last four, and here we are, and um, have a goal of 200 uh, homes this year. I have a team of six, and uh, so I know what, it, know what it's like to build the Roman Empire and then basically watch it crumble and then build it again. What an interesting uh, story. So, so it, it, let's go back to the new home. Um, you know, what did that builder look like? I mean, that, that wasn't a publicly traded home builder. That was a local developer. Well, it was actually public. Um, really? It started out as, no, it was public, uh, WCI. I guess okay. I can say that. Um, and uh, they were a huge developer here, and I was at one of the communities there and started that community. It's a master plan that had 5,000 acres. I started there before there was one home and had put, uh, I guess at that time, maybe uh, 10 or 12 years into it and became, quote, they always called me the mayor. And uh, I developed a great referral business, not only from past customers, but from real estate agents. And, you know, in sales and in life, it's really how you look at things. For example, um, in, in our commission structure, the developer paid us more if there wasn't a co-broke. So most of the office looked at, like, I don't want a co-broke because I, it's a glass half empty. I don't want the brokers to give and bring me business. I'll wait for a customer without a broker, and I won't treat the brokers well because I want the full commission. Well, I looked at it as an opportunity, so I started soliciting the brokers, even though I got – uh, a fewer dollars for sale, but my sales were quadruple or even in, in some some cases higher than that of the, of, of the rest of the folks that were in the in, in the sales team. And so it's like you have to, every situation that comes along, there's an opportunity if you're willing to stare at it long enough. 
Interesting. So, um, so, th- so you were not the only sales guy there. There were there were other people that because it's, it's just you know I'm in San Diego and you know we ever we obviously you know ever, we went through a giant boom from oh well probably 2000, 2001 to to oh seven of course, and this model it just didn't exist right um, at least not here in San Diego. Did the model die uh, uh, completely or does it somehow exist in in Florida? Well, as far as the new home, uh, yeah, new homes, yeah, yeah, it went dormant. Uh, basically, it was alive and well up until about 2005. And I know because I, one of my goals and what's really helped me prepare, uh, uh, propel my business post new home sales is becoming the residential expert, which is one of my passions. That I could teach agents; they have to be the expert on the market, not an expert in marketing. And just that small little change in the ing word will make a, a, a huge difference. But in 2005 and 2006 building basically went to crickets because there was so much uh, building here. We were a bubble market, tremendously overbuilt. Prices fell from a meeting of 322000 to 79.9 in four years and to a point where builders couldn't compete. So, uh, you know, there, there were no lines at 7-Elevens for Slurpees because construction workers had gone somewhere else. Right, right. So, yeah, now, San Diego, now San that has been revived and, and, and good for our economy and, and, um, and the real estate market. But, yes, so it, it went dormant for about four and a half years. Uh, Toby. Interesting. So, so one thing you said that I, that was that uh, the the builder would not let you take walk-ins. You had to go out and you had to you know find people and and lure them into your, your model home there. You know, right. however, you know, tell us how you did that because I'm sure that certainly translated into now what you do today. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, it's you know the there's there's nothing new under the sun. I, I basically uh, adopted the client. And I adopted the realtor. In fact, I talked about the, you know, I would go after the real, real estate business. And so I wanted to be the, to have top of mind awareness for every real estate agent that would be bringing uh, um, clients to that particular development. So I would go out and I would do things for, and I would go into the offices and make presentations and I would break, take them brochures. And then I would reward uh, any, any, any time a broker would bring me a, a prospect, whether they bought or not, I would, what they call, I called, I would mug them which is I had custom mugs made up with my name and my number on it. I'd have it delivered to their office with a bouquet of flowers or candy or something. And I'd say, thanks for thinking me. Thanks for coming out here. And, you know, when you deliver it to the office and everybody else sitting around having coffee and donuts is going to see that and say, where'd you get that? And so um, I would do things like that. Then once a quarter, after I mugged them, I would club them. Uh, once a quarter, I'd take them to a private club that I was a member of, and I would buy them lunch and, you know, and show appreciation. And I did do, do the same thing for my past clients. Um, at the end of the year for the brokers, I'd have a big banquet. I'd give out really nice gifts for all the people that came in. So it just started small. You do the, do, you do the same thing that um, over and over again, it builds momentum. And so... I had I had more business than anybody else with, and I wasn't. And, and what the developer saw, they, well, the developer was really happy about it. But there were 16 salespeople there on top of myself, and they saw me getting a lion's share of the business. And I wasn't smarter than anyone. I just was willing to outwork everyone and basically show appreciation. I did the same for my customers. I had client parties. I had pick pickings. I would have um, ideas like. Um, I, I like play on words. I would have uh, around the Christmas time, around the first something called get taken. And it would basically, I brought in a professional photographer and had the families come over to a, a beautiful mo- a stage model home and I'd have them take a picture. And so, and they would get a free portrait. And uh, the whole thing was, and this is what the, the women really uh, uh, like this because they could use this picture for Christmas cards. I mean, I'm sure the dad was kicking and screaming, but you know, everybody liked to come and get their picture done with the family. And then they would make a, a Christmas cards out of it or whatever. It was totally free. And the, and the photographer was happy to do it because he got some reprints and he got some of the other business from it. So it was a kind of, a win win for everybody. How funny. I started a book. I started a book club. I still have it today. For any any of my clients that come in and basically have kids under ten or twelve, I send them a letter, say welcome to Denny's Book Club, or it's actually called Denny's Reading Club, and I send them a five dollar gift card for a Barnes and Noble book. And if they go and they read a book and they send me a report, it can be an email. I had some kids that are so young, they're 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 and their mom read the book to them, but the kid drew me a little crayon picture. I'd send them another uh, five dollar gift card, and I did that over and over and over again until they stopped reading. 
No, look, no wonder, no wonder everybody called you the mayor. That that is, that, so so you'd mug them, you'd club them, you know, you'd you'd wine and dine them, you'd take them, you know, you'd, you'd throw banquets, you'd do, you're doing all this stuff. And he, you know, in those days, I mean, I, the way I see kind of what you're doing is, you were actually building a team, right? This extended team of other yeah, agents. Exactly, amazing stuff. Exactly. So, so, so when it comes to, right, so there, the, you know, you had an abundance mindset, even though, even though you had to split the commission, um, uh, and the other people didn't want to do that, right? They said, Hey, no, 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 I'm going to wait till somebody comes in and they're not represented because I want the whole thing, right? This kind of scarcity mindset. You were doing more business than everybody. If, if you think about it for me, I just, so I understand this, you know, it was your net, did you, was your net more than everybody else as well, you, you know, because you're doing all this. So you're spending, you're mugging and clubbing and spending money. I was probably, I probably, um, and again, this is going back a number of years, yeah, and so I don't have cool. exact numbers, but I can just tell you that um, it, uh, my, it was like Secretariat went into Belmont. Okay, he won by 32 lengths. I mean, that, that's just how far in advance I was in, in a number of sales. And yes, my net net was well well in advance of anybody else's. Got it. Okay. And the other thing is that people forgot is that when the realtors bring their customers in, I would always protect the realtor. However, realtors sometimes quit, quit don't follow up. And guess that what I have is I have somebody. And Joe Girard said it best. Everybody knows 250 people. So I had another potential. Uh, referral source right in my community that would, would another little oil well that would pump. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I would give up some of my commission to have a future plan of an oil well that would, would, would produce um, uh, more referrals to me. Or guess what? When they went to sell three or four or five years later, I'm still doing their, uh, doing my follow up with these folks, sending birthday cards. I've been doing that for almost 30 years where I send out about 2,500 birthday cards uh, a year, sign every one of them. Um, I, right now I'm putting in a free, well, we have a really uh, groovy uh, chocolate maker here by the name of Norman Love. Can you imagine a name like Love? But I put a little <laughs> coupon in there. Uh, and I, he was, he, they were nice enough to work out with me that these really nice four-color uh, coupons for $5 that I send and I put in every birthday card. And what's interesting is they don't charge me unless, uh, of course, they come in and cash it in. And, and, and so it's just I continue to do that. Uh, knowing that everybody knows 250 people, and you know what, if you stay with somebody long enough, uh, the itch cycle will come back, and they will be needing a real estate agent, and I want to be top of mind. I love it. I love it. So, so if we, again, if we, you know, we're going to move into present tense, but um, you had this team of, you, you went, help walk me through this. You were at the uh, developer, um, and then did you then go traditional, and that's when you built uh, your team of 26? Yes, I left with my, I uh, had, here's the other thing. I'm sitting in new home sales. I, I'm the only one that has an assistant hmm. and, you know, I had to pay for them. And again, I, that was, that was a uh, breaking all kinds of new ground. Um, I was the first one to have a personal computer because again, <laughs> they, they, they basically put their, their whole uh, future in somebody else's hands. I was never willing to do that. So when I left after that meeting on Friday, the 13th in November, uh, I, I took my assistant and uh, into a general real estate office with no listings and um, had to build it all over again. It, it kind of reminds me of that scene in Jerry Maguire. <clears throat> you remember that movie, right? <laughs> Jerry Maguire and he leaves and, you know, he wants I to I didn't take have the, the goldfish. I didn't even have the goldfish. <laughs> So what did you do then? I mean, so you, but you, what you did have is you had this database, right? You had this incredible, right? You had this extended team and you, you had to have had a, just a ton of goodwill in, in the community. Yes. So, the, so how, what did you do from there? How did you, how did you, you know, step up and, and, you know, build this team to 26 and 450 units a year, which is amazing, man. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had looking back. I mean, I could tell you uh, a lot of different things. You know, and it's, and it's a, a lot of basics over and over again. And it's like it's like taking the farmer's approach. You know, you plant, you pamper, and then you get to pick. And you know, so you do that on a daily basis. Uh, but looking back on it, I have to put the asterisk in there. Say from like 1998 or nine, whenever that was. We basically had a growing market, so everybody was doing better. And I was doing better than most. I mean, becoming the top producer because I started, I started having success in a general real estate environment. And then when you start growing and having success, 
um, you start attracting talent. And when, and that's, that's key. If you want to get, you know, and there's a lot of agents out there that just stand alone. They don't even have a team yet. They'd like to get into the team building environment. Well, the first, the first person you want to bring in is an admin. And if you want to get a good admin, you have to, you know, and, and you put an ad in the paper, you're, you're going to get a lot of applications. And so we're generally not good at, from a business mindset. We're maybe great salespeople, but what I had to do is I had to learn great business skills. Yeah. Just because I had graduated from college uh, with a business degree and had an MBA did not make me a good businessman. But I had to learn. I went to a lot of a lot of educational events that taught me how to be a better business person. I went to and read a lot of great books like the E Myth and other books like that. E Myth Revisited on how to create systems, how to create duplicatable um, systems because. Unless I wanted to sell, and I was doing in production with, with one assistant, I was selling about 70 homes by myself with one assistant. I was doing all the listing, I was doing all the taking buyers around, and, and, and so I had an assistant helping me with, with the clerical and the administrative side. I, then I started bringing on the first buyer's agent, and then the second buyer's agent had a growing market, which helped. Uh, because I've seen the opposite of that in the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. And uh, one thing, um, Toby, build on another, and I started seeing success, and then I started splitting off into uh, and following basically a, a model that I really like. There was a book out there called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent that, that Gary Keller wrote that tells you how to build a winning team, how to make a million dollars in real estate. And you know what? And I talk about gross, a million dollars in real estate, and I did. Was was that your goal? I mean, you know, a lot of times on the show, right? We 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 talk about your why, right? For some, for for you, I mean, you, real estate. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, that's what you've done, <clears throat> and now you you know, so you built a team, you went out, you grossed a million bucks. Hopefully, you did. Hopefully, at some point, you netted a million bucks. <clears throat> no, but, no, I no, yeah, right. I got it. I mean, I netted. I'm not about gross commission. I netted a million dollars at the peak of the market. Awesome. How did that feel for you? It felt pretty good, but you know, I had watched my business double and double and double. And you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I didn't go out and buy Lear jets and yachts. Uh, I bought a lot of investment property. I know you have an investor audience and I didn't go with high leverage. I went pretty conservative, 20% down. I didn't fill out any um, liar loan applications. Very conservative. I'm kind of a Midwest roots type of guy. Um, had plenty of money in the bank, but you know, I kind of got caught up in something that I made a couple of mistakes looking back. For, and again, I don't know if you want to go, this, go yes. into the mistakes, but yes. let me tell you one of, the, one of the things. When your business is doubling or is getting better every year, that should, you should ask yourself and stop a minute and take, take note of your surroundings. How much of it is external? How much is – because now we're in right. kind of a recovering and improving market. And if your business – I mean, anyone can swim fast downstream, but, you know, that downstream led to the Niagara Falls. And so a lot of us thought we were Mark Spitz or Michael Phelps, but basically we were heading for the falls. And so I was watching my business grow so fast, I, was, I began to start to think I was good. Right. And I had 26 people on the team, and, you know, I was just, you know, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And I remember thinking, you know, gosh, it's been, I've been doing this now 20 years. All those books I read and Zig Ziglar and all those things that I went through, they're right. You write it down, it happens. It does. But little things inside my business I wasn't paying attention to. So when you have 450 homes coming in, and I didn't do that every year, that was at the peak, but they kept growing up to that. My systems weren't built for that. And so every now and then you have to reinvent yourself. You have to reinvent your systems because I could handle 100 or 200 new transactions, but the follow-up and that, and that touch, the clubbings, the muggings, uh, the birthday cards, I had so much new business coming in. I, 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 let, I let the mortar in my building blocks, which is basically my customer, high touch, follow up, being involved, knowing the kids' names. I couldn't keep up. And one of the biggest enemies of, a grow, of, of your business is too much business coming in. And so I tell my salespeople, I tell you what, the, enemies, the, the enemy of your future business is your current business because you're going to spend so much time trying to get your, your, uh, your transactions. I hate, uh, don't like the word deals. You're trying to get them closed that you're not out lead generating. 
And so you've got to be planting, pampering, and, and then you get the pick. I had a, I had a harvest season largely because the economy down here just d- delivered it. Now, yes, I worked hard. I had great people, but I didn't pay attention to my systems. I didn't upgrade my systems to maintain that high level of touch that I built my business on. And, and, when, the, and when the market, basically it's like somebody yelled fire in a crowded room, our market went down, like I said, from 322 to 79.9. There's not a roller coaster in the United States that has that type of um, a decline on yeah, it. Right. No. No, the, the G forces would kill you. Right. So um, now I'm on. Now I'm going back. So it's it's, it's kind of like Back to the Future. I am going back, and I had uh, when I when when I so let me just go a little bit further. I had a team of 26. So what's the next progression? This isn't really following basically the the model in the millionaire real estate uh, agent. I started saying, well, you know what? I guess. We've got the baby boomers retiring, which, and, and so our market is going to get better. So now is the time to leave my broker and open up my own firm. I, I had a partner. We bought a building for a million dollars. We put about $700,000 into interior enhancements. I'm still in the building now, but um, about the time we opened it. Had the, had the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce here, you know, and had the river, ribbon cutting, and they – and they gave you the plaque with a dollar bill in it. You know things are bad when you when the dollar's gone, okay? And so I watched. And basically, by the time we cleaned up the, the mess or the the, the the party, the opening party, the the, the market started to um, started to fall. Oh. The twenty six people had to go get jobs. Yeah. And now I'm in twelve thousand plus square feet with a twenty thousand dollar a month nut, and I know business. Oh my gosh, that that the, the echo, the echo. <laughs> that was that's a lonely 12,000 square feet. It is. I mean, um and the eighth wonder of the world should be how fast a bathtub drains when you shut off the spigot. Because I had plenty of money in the bank, plenty of money. But you know what? I didn't make decisions fast enough. I should have jettisoned expenses. And I just watched that money go. I had I had uh, credit lines. I had all kinds of I had all kinds of lifeboats. But you know what? When the lifeboats are gone, now you have to deal with you know uh, what are you going to do? And so I go back now, and and I basically um, you know so I don't brag about the 450 homes a year, 150 million dollars. It was great. Um, I am basically now building back again. So, so after, after the building, basically, everybody leaves. Um, I have another broker that came in. I was the broker. This, my name was on the building. I watched the sign company come, take my name off the building, put their name on it. Now I'm working for them. Ugh. You know, there's no – there. sometimes humbling uh, is a good thing. There's lessons. Let's go back to what I said in the first part of the interview. You can look at something that's half full. Or half empty, and so I'm looking. This as an opportunity to learn, to grow. Great books will be written about the, what's happened over the last eight years, and right now I don't know what the name of my book's going to be, but a good title would be "Coming Back from the Dead." Is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I was there by myself, and now I'm up to six. I'm following the models of, of recruiting, finding the right people, attracting talent, and building back up again. Again, our goal this year is 200 homes, and you know we're going to build it back up, and we are doing it. We've got some great people. I've made a lot of mistakes in hiring. I'm back in production for a little bit, but I'm going after a lot of the young people. You know, I'm like I've been this. I'm in my 50s, late 50s. I've done this 30 some years. I'm I'm seeing people in their 20s that are just killer. They just they, they they have an understanding of technology, but the, the most important thing is they want to learn. They haven't formed a lot of bad habits, probably not many habits at all. And I'm seeing so I'm seeing the next generation coming into this business, and I'm going after those people and and building my team on that type of talent. Got it. Well, let, let's 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 go back for a second um, because. Uh, you kind of talked about a mindset issue, right? So, and I, and I, I can, I can relate with a lot of the stuff that you're saying. So if we go back, you know, at the peak, right, you said uh, everybody can swim fast downstream. So you were in an environment where, I mean, look, if you were an investor, uh, or, or just somebody who bought a house in Oh three, you could buy anything at any price and you would make money on it. It was just like, that's what real estate was at that time. So you, you know, so you built this business. 
you kind of start thinking that you have the Midas touch, right? <laughs> because you, you, right. you could do no wrong. Uh, so at the peak, you know, you, you, you net a million bucks. <laughs> you know, I, earlier I said, how did that feel? Did, did you feel, <laughs> with all the success, did you feel like at some, you know, I know you're working hard, but d- d- was there ever feeling like, man, I don't, I don't deserve this? Or did you have any of those kind of thoughts? No, it's actually kind of the opposite, meaning, you know, I, I went back, as I said earlier, and said, you know, I guess all that stuff that I learned from the Zig Ziglar's yeah. of the world that basically I listened to in cassette tapes uh, works. You just, you know, you set the goals, you write them down. You know, I didn't, I'm not the kind of guy that would duct tape them in my shower, but at some point you wake up, you know what, it happened. And so I, I just thought that was like, you know, if you do this, that happens. Gotcha. And so I didn't really think I didn't deserve it or whatever, and I didn't think it, it was all me. I just thought, oh, I guess, okay, well, if you, if you jump off a ladder, you hit the ground. It's just a given. Right, okay. So, so then, then talk to me, uh, and, well, and everybody. So, you know, you, you have a bunch of cash in the bank, right? You have this building. Uh, you have a bunch of lifeboats. And you use those, it sounded to me like you use those lifeboats up one by one until like maybe you had one left. And, and that's when you said, okay, listen, I'm going to take my name off the building and put somebody else in here. <clears throat> did, I, did I hear that wrong or is that what happened? Because yep. again, there's a mindset issue there. Why did you do that? Did you feel like, um, you know, again, that you had the talent, you'd done the work and uh, I'll just use this one lifeboat up and, uh, you know, I'm going to turn it around. And then you used another one up, and then, you know, because I'm going to turn around this time. Well, no, it was really out of necessity. I mean, really, at that point in time, I mean, people eat insects if they're hungry enough. So the, the issue is that, and I see investors, uh, like, we, we, were, we were the poster child of a distressed market. So a lot of those investors that came in and bought my, uh, property in 03, 04, 05, and, of course, the game of musical chairs stopped in 06, and so now, and, but, but uh, sellers in, in a falling market typically are in denial. And so I was using up my lifeboats and I was kind of, I was in reality, but, but thinking basically I had more lifeboats than the, than, than, than the recession had recession. If you follow what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, I do. I do. And it's like, but what's interesting is the sellers or the, the investors are the same way. I mean, they, they realize they made a bad investment. And so rather than basically understanding what a sunk cost is, they, they are optimistic or they are ostrich and they put their head in the sand and think, okay, this will get better. And they keep throwing money into it. We deal with sellers all the time. In fact, I, I, what I've learned, uh, Toby, our, our objective in a real estate business has nothing to do with property. We are actually in what I call a moving business. We have to move people from the most crowded state in the nation, which is the state of denial into reality. And so people that have made a bad real estate decision, they understand and we tell them what the market is now. They say, well, no, I'll wait. Yeah. Well, that was me, you know, and, and they're losing money. They're losing money by waiting because the, right now the market's not going to uh, outrun, the appreciation's not going to outrun what it costs them to own. And so I just got to the point where I had no other options. My money had been drained. My team was gone. Um, you know, our values, basically, we had in our marketplace – 12 homes for sale under $100,000 in 2006. And in 2009, we had over 4,000 homes for sale under $100,000. So now, not only do we have a lot of this inventory, which is uh, investor-rich opportunities, but investors were waiting because inventory was still building. There was still downward pressure on on housing values. Now you have to go out and 200 of them for an investor buy a home that worth $36,000. What's the commission on that? Right. So now you are basically riding a 10 speed bike at low gear. So you're pu- moving a lot of muscles, but you're not getting much traction. And so it was like a perfect storm. Um, so I, I just had waited too long. I should have made better business decisions on the way down. I, I got to the point, like most sellers get to the point where they finally say, you know what? We're, we're going to have to short sale this because, you know, I've drained my savings. I've maxed my credit cards out. I have no other options now. They should have made that decision well before that. Yeah. And look, you know, I, we've all done it. I think we've all done it at some point. I, I, I certainly have done it with stocks, you know, right? And there's a sector that I made money on. All of a sudden, the, the market moves against that sector. <clears throat> I lose my money. Guess what? I move it. Then I, then I buy, I, I double down, uh, you know, and I buy more on margin. <clears throat> I still lose money. I, and, and then, you know, <clears throat> well, the stock loses its value. Uh, and then I take my, to, to, I start covering 
margin calls out of my bank account. And then I start taking ca- I remember this one time. I start taking cash advances off my credit card to pay for the margin calls. <clears throat> um, there you go. You know, just so and look, this points to the thing you said. By the way, Denny, you are a fabulous speaker. I love all the metaphors. I love all the analogies. Um, this is uh, it, it's this is very entertaining even for me. But what you said earlier, you said the biggest state in, in the world or, or in the nation, or whatever, is the state of denial. Um, and even today, buyers, both buyers and sellers, they don't live in reality, right? They live in the past, right? The sellers want to say, "Oh, geez, in '06 my house was worth this," uh, and buyers say, "Geez, in '09 the house was worth that." So, how do you today? What is the system that you use to to get people um, into the state of presence? Well, first you have to know how deep they are in denial. I mean, we, we meet people that are so deep in denial they can hear banjo music. So one of the one of the ways we do that is in the first in the first interview, I'll ask a question like, "Mr. Mrs. Seller." And I, most of my listing interviews, by, by the way, are in my office because there's no such thing as a bad property. There are only bad property owners. There's, you can sell any property in any market at the right price, but you can't sell anything uh, in any market if you've got an unrealistic seller. Yeah. So I bring them in to interview them. And so my script is, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, based on your opinion of the market, and there's no right or wrong here, do you feel the market's working in your favor, meaning the prices are going up, or are they, continue, are they, or are they continuing to slide? Now that is a that is a, thermo, a a meat thermometer in the prime rib because they're going to say, well, you know, you know, I, I was asking us when the market was still falling, or even now the market's going up, but you know what, it's not going up in all price ranges, and this is this is the thing. People read the fact that the market's getting better; they think it applies to every price range and every market segment in in, in the United States, and that's not necessarily true. So if they answer that question and say, well, you know, I think prices are going up. And I happen to know that they're in a uh, golf course community. There's $800,000 basically in their home. And there's only been three $800,000 houses sell in that particular zip code in the last, you know, since Ford was president. I know that, you know what, we have some wood to chop. So I, I have to basically get them into reality before I decide I'm going to take a listing and then put all this time and effort into it and realize, you know, they're going to wait for the market to come back. The same script works for the buyers because you're exactly right. You know, um, we still have buyers coming down here that have, that are somehow locked in this time, uh, time vault where value, we had all this inventory and they still have a realistic, ex, unrealistic expectation of what they can buy here because their uncle Joe bought something on the beach for $19,500. And when they get down here, they realize that wasn't the purchase price. That was the annual maintenance cost. But still, that's their expectation. So we, we have to find out right away um, from, from the very first question we ask them where they are on the, on, in, in, as far as reality goes. Got it. And then we have to begin educating them. And so my, my specialty is really um, – uh, my, my team works with a lot of buyers, but – you know, we have a system right now in this market that can guarantee a seller top market value because of how the market how the market works. And this is what a lot of real estate agents don't quite understand. There are some axioms in the real estate world that are true all the time. And most real estate agents don't understand how how the real estate market really works. Um, so that's that's our differential advantage. That's I have an ad basically on, on the radio, and the radio is a killer for me. I even put it in print that I can sell your home. Uh, like, uh, for example, have you heard a lot of agents bragging about how fast they sell a home? Yeah, yeah, right. I sold it in 13 or put it under contract in 13 days for, you know, 10 grand over the asking price. Absolutely. You right. know, that's, yeah. I will contend, and I am, and my book will be about this, is the fact that they undersold that. Huh. Because you know what? I mean, it, it, and so when I meet with a seller, logically, they, they believe that anyway. So my whole ad campaign is you want to uh, sell fast, you want to sell for more money. Selling fast is great, but for selling for more money is even better. And you know what? If I don't sell your home at a price that you, that you like, uh, um, are guaranteed to buy it. So, I mean, I, I go out there in a very bold statement. And basically, a lot of people are calling me. And, my, and, and in this market, with the market starting to come back up, it used to be like sellers who just wanted you to sell their home. Now sellers believe... We're having more sellers believe their house is worth more than it is, or it's appreciating faster than it is. So I appeal to their natural need of, like, greed. They have, in our marketplace and around the world, around the country, sellers have had, the buyers have had their, their foot on the throat of sellers for, the, you know, four years. And now, finally, the market's coming back up. Our median sales price is up to, like, 200000 finally. 
uh, not anywhere near where it was, but to a manageable level. Um, so sellers want to feel like they have an agent that understands that, you know what, um, why can't we be aggressive for a change? Because buyers, by golly, have been aggressive for a while. They haven't beaten us up. So why can't we be aggressive? And, you know, there is no sin in overpricing a home. There hmm. isn't. There isn't. It used to be, and I've learned the time activity curve way back when. You know that when you first put the home on the, on the market, your best chance for activity is in the first few weeks. After that, it stales. Have you heard that before? Of course, yeah. I don't believe that. Why? I don't believe that's as, I don't believe that's as true as it used to be because that theory was developed before we had something called the Internet. We had real estate people that had to go to the Holiday Inn on Tuesday morning and pick up an NLS book and basically then go and, hey, I, I have a new listing down the street in Whiskey Creek. We're going to come by. I'll have a lasagna dinner. Come by and preview this home. Well, we had, we had no way of letting the world know what that house was, how much it was priced, okay? So basically the agent's first impression of it, if it was wrong, it was locked in the agent's mind. However, now, basically, because of the Internet, once you put a home on MLS, it's viral, it's around the world, that every, every buyer seen it. It's, just, it's not a finite group of realtors. It's basically infinite. And you know what? If it's too high you won't get any action on it. But if you lower the price, because there's a lot of people that lock in their searches on all these different websites, as soon as that listing falls into the bucket of somebody's search parameters, it's new to them. You're right. And, for, and you know what? They're, they're, and, and so and here's something else I want you to understand too, Toby, is that two types of buyers are going to see that. They're going to have the unseasoned buyer, which means they've just entered our marketplace. They're coming down here with their motorhome to be parked on our, in our parking lot, so they, they plan on looking at property on the weekends and then going back and thinking about coming back the next weekend. Are you kidding me? I mean, that, homes are going so faster, you can't do that, but they're unseasoned. They have to get into the market, lose a few homes, find one they want, get out bid on it a couple times, and over time, guess what? They go from denial to reality. Now they're seasoned. Mm. That's, the kind of, that's the kind of buyer we're looking at when we list a home. And so if we put one out there that's a little bit aggressive on the pricing, now what do they do? They lost three homes already. They're tired of the looking process. And it goes out there. The husband and wife look at each other and say, what do you think? Well, honey, just buy the damn house, will you please? Because, you know, I'm tired of this whole process. And they make it and they put an offer in on it. Yeah, yeah, we still have to deal with the appraisal. But, you know, this is the language the sellers want to hear. This is the, this is the language that's helping us land more listings, and, uh, and we certainly get our share of listings. We don't, we don't take every listing we interview with, but if a seller will buy into this philosophy, they, you, uh, an agent can guarantee to maximize their sales price. Interesting. So, so that, that's, that, again, that, that is very interesting to me. So, so uh, in terms of pricing, I've tried it both ways, right? I have tried um, – uh, uh, being aggressive on when I sell a house, uh, uh, putting up for more than it's worth, right? Or, or very, very tippy top of the comps, or maybe you know ten grand over the the comparable. Uh, I've I've tried doing ranges, and I've tried pricing it cheaply. Now, I've, you know, you get mixed results. You know, when I price it cheap or within a range, I've had agents get mad at me because they'll come in with an offer at the you know within that range at the lower part, and I'm like, I'm not going to take that. And, and you know, I've had a lot of people yell at me. What in terms of maximizing the you know somebody's going to somebody in our audience, Denny is going to try to replicate you know this this process for them in their market where, where how should they do that what's what do you, what, what is optimal well okay generally speaking now you can look at comps and uh, and, and comps are good but you know it's driving it's dri like driving through the rearview mirror if, if you are in first of all you have to know what market you're in the only way to know what market you're in and here's another axiom in real estate, Toby, you may not have heard. You know, you ask realtors if they in a buyer, a buyer's market or seller's market, and, and you'll get an answer. But the truth is, and I don't, haven't seen any geographical area that's an exception yet, every market, every geographical area um, has all three markets co coexisting at the same time. In some price segments, you have buyer's market. Some price segments, you have seller's market. Other price segments, you have equilibrium. Now, agents need to understand that because they will go around, and our board was doing this, saying we are in a seller's market because we've got 4.6 months of inventory. Now, what does that say to the seller who's got that $800,000 home in this one little subdivision? Basically, there hasn't been any uh, absorption in it because he's overbuilt. 
Yeah. So you can't you can't you can't make generalization. So a, the first the first thing an agent has to do is understand segment is market. What is the absorption by price ranges, and how and where is that moving? Zero to six months of inventory is considered a seller's market. Probably you know shortage of inventory, upward pressure on price. Six to ten, six to twelve months of inventory is equilibrium. Above that, it's going to be a buyer's market. So I segment my price, my my whole market by price range. I have a graph. In fact, I learned this from a memory class. You you can never forget anything if you associate it with something you already know. So it's called a memory hook. So I use something buyers know. I, I when you go to the doctor's office. There's this BMI chart on the wall. It says if you're six foot and 200 pounds, it gives you a, a green, uh, you know, you're in healthy or unhealthy range. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, body mass index. Yes, I am. Body mass index, exactly. So I have a BMI uh, uh, index for real estate. I call it the buyer's market index, and it's a BMI. And so I, I graph everything out in the same colors, and I, and I show sellers where they are in their price range, basically – uh, and and where the market where the market is, can you afford to overprice? And if you can, okay, um, uh, are, are we are we going to have to wait a long time or not? So, for example, I have a I have a in, in our marketplace two fifty down is what I call the American Idol market. We put a house on the market. It looks like the tryouts for American Idol because there's no inventory. Everybody meets beats the beeline to the door. When you get above that, it starts to slow down quite a bit. So we had this home that was just above that uh, optimal market. It's like almost close to $300,000. The seller wasn't in a hurry. And um, I almost, I told him, if we get to 100 showings, I've never had a listing with 100 showings. We were at 92 showings. Wow. And we finally got an offer on it. And what happened was, because he was in a market that was low on inventory, he waited for the price to come up. And I don't re recommend that because when, we, when, when an agent, were, if they were going to take a listing, there's only three things that can happen. And you know what to do based on the outcomes. The outcomes are low to no activity. If you have low to no activity, you're overpriced by probably too much. The second outcome is activity but no offers. You're overpriced by a little bit. And the third is, is it sells. There are no other options. And, and, and if an agent gets three things right, I know I'm giving you a lot of information here, but you know, I hopefully love people can l listen to this a couple of different times. The agent's responsible for three things. It's ACE, A-C-E, accurate information, uh, compelling description, engaging photography. If we can get those three, three things right on MLS, which gets auto-populated through IDX to all the websites around the world, basically <clears throat> it's, there's nothing else we can do to cause that home to be sold. If it's overpriced, nothing. Yep. So the, 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 the sin or the, the, the problem comes in when agents take an overpriced listing, they leave it on the market at that price for so long, then it will stale. They have to lower the price incrementally. After in, in our marketplace in, you know, typically two or three weeks, we'll know if we don't get activity, uh, we, we lower it down incrementally. And until we basically do. And once we start getting activity, it's kind of like a metal detector that comes over a quarter. The closer you get to the quarter, the more clicks you get. Basically, as that price comes down and close to that top market value, the more showings you get, you know you're getting close to the range. That's when a buyer may step in, particularly one of the season's buyers, and give you an offer. Got it. Well, look, first of all, uh, I love all this information. And uh, it reminds me, I got a tweet yesterday from somebody in my audience. And they, what they, they took a picture of, of the, they said show notes. And literally, this person had three pages of notes from one episode. So I guarantee you, there are people out there right now fiercely scribbling away at all this stuff. <clears throat> I love your th this BMI, right? So you have this zero to six month. You can segment the market by, by uh, the inventory. Would you suggest for people out there, you know, as they build their business, you know, should they, you know, it's it's. Uh, should they like try to play in all the you know all three of these? Should they be um um, okay? Look, let me see. Let me say this differently. So the two fifteen under is going to be the zero. To, you know, there's going to be a, a scarcity of in the, uh, of inventory for those. And the eight hundred, the upper range, the eight hundred k range, right? There's going to be almost no activity there. <clears throat> When people try to think about how to specialize or build their businesses, should they take these 
different segments into account and and try to um, be deliberate about about attacking these different segments. I don't know if that made any well, I think sense. Well, I, let me let me let me. Uh, I think I know what you're asking. Let me give okay. it a stab. Yeah, thanks. Right, so uh, you're talking about a newer agent that comes into the business, or an agent that basically would like to basically supercharge their business. Yes. Okay. Well, absorption is an important thing. I know it's a fancy word, but basically it means how many homes are selling. And, and if you decide because you happen to like, you know, a particular area because it, it's the, the lifestyle of the rich and famous, and, and they're all forty million dollar homes, but only one sells every four years. You may want to think about the probability of you selling one. Can you survive that long? So yes, I mean you should look at it from a farming standpoint because an agent, if you want, if you want to change, well, there's only another axiom is basically, and this is just true. You've heard this from about everybody is that your business is where it is right now because a you don't know what to do, or b you know what to do and you're not doing it. And there's most people fall into that category because they won't pick up the phone and lead generate. Lead generates number one. So you should be doing that, letting the people know you're in the business, letting your start with your cell phone. At least those people will answer the phone and let them know what you're doing. Then secondly, find a geographic area. And then in that analysis, Toby, you should be figuring out, is this an area that turns over or not? Is there a mixture? Like, for example, the geographic area that I specialize in. I mean, we have the 200 to nowadays in the market, maybe 600. So there's a lot of activity. So agents, you, you know, I mean, you may love a particular neighborhood, but if there's no turn there, you're not going to really make any money. So you, you should analyze the market and make sure you have some of that, uh, some, some turnover. Okay, got it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, you, you, I, we were talking very similarly. Um, so listen, I, we're, I, I, you are, again, a fabulous speaker. I mean, we spent 45 minutes here. Um, I want to ask you about just time management because <clears throat> you have a lot of stuff going on. You, you know, you're both selling houses, right? You have a goal of 200 homes this year. Uh, you have a team of six. You also want to build up that team. <clears throat> How do you stay productive and focused on a day-to-day basis? Well, it's uh, it, it is an ongoing discipline. I um, mean, obviously, um, um, in real estate. People love real estate because they can be their own boss. There's no one to tell them what to do. But, you know, most people don't succeed because there's no one to tell them what to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. true. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it is. It's totally true. Um, I have a calendar. And, you know, what you here's the here's the bottom line. It generally starts in the gym. You have to have somebody to hold you accountable. Because particularly if you're an agent, you know, we, we're pretty good at holding other people accountable. We're not good at holding ourselves accountable. So it's something you have to have a mindset to do. And, um, and, and I, and the other thing, and you kind of touched on a little bit ago earlier in the, in the conversation about the why your why has to drive you because you know what, in my day, I'm kind of a crazy guy. I get up at three five every morning. I go to the gym, I come to the office, I get home about 12 o'clock. I go to bed early. I don't, you know, I'm in bed between nine and 10 o'clock. And so I, I don't have, you know, so I, I'm kind of an early guy. Yeah. I front loaded on the early side. And so I come into the office and get some things done before the phone even rings. In fact, our team has a huddle every morning at 845. And there's probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 people in this particular office. And when you see my team here, every one of my team members are here, and there's no one else in the office, which is probably duplicated in many offices around the, the, the city. Is it any wonder why we find the worms before somebody else does? So we have that daily huddle to hold each other accountable. We have shared Google calendars, and I t- encourage my t- people to time block. I have to give a plug in. I know you had Jay Pappas on, 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 the, um, on the show uh, yeah. not long ago. Probably the best business book out there, the best for any business, including real estate, is uh, their new book, Gary Keller's new book, The One Thing. Hmm. I'd recommend that that be read. Uh, every I bought a copy for every member on our team because generally speaking, um, and I'm a little ADD-ish, um, I have to basically block out interruptions. I have to sh- shut my email down every time it once, and I have to, tr- I, I don't even have my, my phone does not, my cell phone doesn't even ring anymore. It doesn't vibrate. It's, it sits there by itself because I'll want to pick it up because it'll be another squirrel and I love to chase squirrels. So I have to eliminate squirrels. I have to get the important thing done first. And it is a daily, it's almost like a smoker quitting smoking. You know, you, you want, it's a daily decision. And so I don't know, you just get better at controlling it. I'm not sure you ever master it. Yeah. 
I, I, I know everybody struggles with that. And, you know, I just did a, a solo episode uh, that is coming out today. And I talk about this a little bit it, because, you know, when you, it, you know, you can time block and say, I'm going to do X. But then you're like, oh, I'm going to check my email or and then, and geez, I got th- four Facebook, whatever. There's a there's a, a there's a time switching cost there. Right. And, and the science says that, you know, if you if you're working on your project, then you go check email and you go back to your project. It takes 11 minutes for you to get back into the zone of where you're at on your project. That's it. So that's it. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Good. No, no. I mean, you're exactly right. No, I was just going to say, you know, it's definitely a learned skill, right? Just like making decisions or whatever. How is it, uh, does it, is it easier for you because you're such an early riser, you know, when, when there's less people in the office or less things going on, right? People aren't sending you an email at 4.30 in the morning. Um, is that, is that kind of how you uh, tackle that? Yeah, but, you know, what's kind of interesting, too, and I use it to my advantage, um, you know, obviously with smartphones, I'm checking my email, uh, you know, on the way to the gym and whatever, and, you know, maybe in the parking lot. If you, if you want to impress your client, respond to their email at 4 in the morning. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm being totally serious about that. Now, if, if that's not your personality, then don't do it. But I'm just saying, you know what? And if, if they comment on it, I would use it to my advantage. So, Mr. Mr. Ms. Seller, I mean – Buyers are calling more than one agent. Wouldn't you want your agent maybe being the first one to respond? Right. So. I love it. Uh, I love it. Listen, I don't want to take up too much. We're gonna, I'm going to try to wrap this up. I'm going to ask you kind of a crazy question. I do not ask everybody this question, but uh, you, uh, you are a guy that I, you have a wealth of, of great advice. So here it is. <clears throat> uh, is there something I didn't ask you? Denny, that I should have asked you. Uh, is there some kind of critical piece of information that you have in your brain that uh, that uh, we need to dig out of there? Well, that's a, that is uh, that is a great question. Uh, and now, with a live audience or uh, maybe on the radio, I think <laughs> I, I tell you what. Here it is for me. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would I kind of summarize the whole call this way. Number one. You are where you are because you're, you don't know what to do or you're not doing it. Decide that first. Number two, bad things have happened to all of us. It's what you do with it that matters. Opportunity does not exist without risk. Yes. And number three, or number four, be a marcher. Life, success, accomplishment is not done in the 100-yard dash. It's putting on the boots, regardless of how you feel, regardless of what the weather is, and yep. marching. You would be surprised how far you get if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's it, man. And you know, right, pace yourself. You're going to go a lot farther. Um, you know, if you, you know, it is. Uh, there's a. I, I talked about this on the show today. There's a. There's a runner, a guy who tr- teaches people how to run marathons, and he's like, listen, you know, intense activity back off intense activity back off you know and you it's, it's amazing how you know that's how people finish marathons denny thank you man i really appreciate you coming on the show i know you mentioned jay's book shift and by the way if anybody wants a copy of that you you can get a free copy at uh, with our link audibletrial.com slash super agents life is there another book that that you think you could uh, that uh, people should read because that's look you you jumped the gun one of my last questions is this here's my last question <clears throat> I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Well, I would, uh, uh, you said shift shifts a great book. Oh, the one thing I'm sorry. Yeah. The one thing, uh, and then if you don't have enough to buy the other one, borrow it. It's the millionaire real estate agent. Got it. And you know, what's amazing, man is, uh, I have three kids and um, the, my my oldest one, her school is right by a library. I haven't been in a library for 20 years. <clears throat> and it's a, it's amazing. You can just go in the library and if they don't have the book, you can at least in my library, you can say, hey, can you order this? And they will order it for you. So, you know, if you don't, you know, for, you know, look, you know, if you don't have the cash, but you want to read just you can also get these books at the library. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, it, it, I, I never thought about that. You know, I, I don't even know where our libraries are in, in this town, so I should probably, <laughs> uh, should probably look, look at them. For sure, man. For sure. Hey, well, Denny, again, thank you so much for coming on. I, I, you're one of the few guests that, that uh, I would love to have you back on in the future. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if you're open to that or not, but uh, 
It'd be great, Toby. It's fun. I'd love to do it. I'd love to share. And uh, there'll be a, a, a dozen other things we can have fun talking about. For sure. Well, listen, uh, tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, my direct uh, website is uh, Danny at DannyGrimes.com. Um, I've uh, Danny Grimes uh, and Company on Facebook. And Twitter is uh, at Danny Grimes Co. C-O. Awesome. All right. And listen, everybody, I know there's a lot of stuff in here. We're going to have the show notes. Just go to superagentslive.com, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to write it all down. Hey, Denny, thanks again. I appreciate it. Go get them. All right, Toby. Have so, a bye. great day. Bye. Bye Let's go. Yeah.